yes, it is time to mount my Phalaenopsis pulchra. She's been, as you can see, pretty much through the ringer, trying to figure out how this orchid grows its roots. I've lost many, many roots in the process, but it gave me time to observe and study how her root growth can influence the way I'm going to try and grow this orchid on and grow it well. And as you can see, the roots of my pulchra are going everywhere, but they never ever went down into the pot. The ones that are here were already growing down, but the new ones are going all over the place. So, welcome to this mounting of my Phalaenopsis pulchra video. Appreciate having you here. You just saw that I prepared the mount. I've been thinking and pondering how to go about this the best way. And I've come to a conclusion, sorry for that jiggle, I've got King between the tripod, of course. He was lying in the sun, now that we're talking, he has to lie right here. Anyway, so I've been thinking quite a while how I can go about giving this orchid a mount that would do it justice. My other alternative was to put it into lava rock in a classic semi-hydro setup, but I am wary of all these roots growing everywhere. And then also of this orchid being so prone to growing keikis. I appreciate having you here. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. A like would also be super appreciated if that's not asking too much. And if you haven't subscribed, maybe I can be so bold as to ask you to subscribe. And thank you for that in advance. Right, back to the pulchra. Now it would appear that it's pretty straightforward to mount this orchid. But you can see that I also have some still beautiful roots to contend with, and they've been used to a quite wet environment, like this one here. It's kind of liked where it was living, so we'll figure things out as we go. Let me get my mount. It's a big piece, and no, I haven't made a mistake. I want the bigger part to be on the top and the smaller part to be on the bottom because if need be, then one day I can just set it on a shelf. If the orchid gets top heavy, we're gonna have this issue, but you know, for the time being, we're just gonna rejoice that it is not that time of year. I don't have to figure it out, but I did want the broader part at the surface because this orchid has to be mounted upside down, at least for the time being. What it does as it grows, different story. Now you may also think, yeah, well, sphagnum moss and then etc. etc. I do not use sphagnum moss. I use a hob filter material as opposed to sphagnum moss. It's inorganic. And it is kind of my thing is first to get her positioned and I'm not taking off any old roots in case I need some to support me. I don't want to be relying on the roots that are viable. So everything at this point in time stays as it is. And then afterwards, I can do some trimming if that is necessary. Meanwhile, if it's not necessary, then the old roots can stay because when they're wet, they also form a little buffer of humidity in my super dry climate. So as she's going upside down, we also have this keiki to contend with. And yes, I may be training it in a direction where I want it to grow so that the roots will hopefully attach to the mount if feasible, it can go down here, but we're gonna have to work around how the spike and the keiki, huh, how I'm gonna position that. But first of all, we gotta get the mother plant at least attached. And for that thinking process, that's what took me so, so long, now that I've decided to mount her. In that thinking process, I'm thinking of drilling, because I'm not doing fishing wire around and around and around. I'm thinking of drilling two holes left and right of the stem, and then I'm going to thread fishing wire crisscross over her. So I'm gonna make my markers because I kind of like her position. She's pretty well centered. We can scooch her up a little higher just because we have the space. And for the time being, of course, I'm very, very mindful of all the roots that are beautiful. We'll see how this goes once we do our little fishing line crisscross. So I've got a point there and I've got a point there. 
Now, thankfully, she's not that heavy. I hope that this summer is the summer where she will attach some roots as they grow. Hopefully, new root growth. That would be awesome. Let's get those nails into their designated position. Okay, that was a bit of a buttery one. I don't like, I don't want it to be loose. At the end of the day, these nails are the support to hold the orchid in place. So let's see if we can get a grip with this one when we screw it in that we can rely on. Yeah, that's pretty safe. That's solid in there. Now the plan, of course, long term is if the orchid ever attaches herself and is, let's say, independent of any supports I'm adding now, I'm going to unscrew these screws. They'll be gone. That would be the perfect scenario. I only drilled the holes just a fraction. So as I'm using the screws to go straight through the cork, that is what is keeping it tight. I saw some movement here. But I think we're okay. There's nothing cracking from that. Right. Next up is some fishing line. And we're going to do a slip knot. I'm going to add a clip as I do this slip knot so that you can see what I'm doing because through the fishing line, there's not much to see here. Okay, with that done, I've got a nice generous tie. I hope this is visible somewhat. Put my loop over the nail. Keeping my tie off right there. In my sights, get the orchid, put her back where initially I thought she would be great. <laughs> so we'll try and replicate that. There we go. And now it's just a question, not with that one. Not with a tie-off string, <laughs> with a fishing line. And now it's just a question to not catch any roots, but to zigzag back and forth using the nails as my catch. And if I'm not 100% sure, I'm going to go around that nail a second time just to make sure it doesn't slip. Keeping things tight. You see that slipped? Okay. You see a line there? That is the leaf joint. That is not, that is not from the fishing line. Okay, so that's slipped twice now. So my theory is to do what I've already done once, but to keep doing it until the orchid is secure without the fishing line slipping from the nail. So we'll do, we might have to repeat a couple of turns before we loop over again. Learning by doing, as they say. Again, keeping things tight, but not to the point of cutting the orchid in half. And the same thing is happening here on the other side. I'm going to go around the nail several times just to make sure nothing slips there. And seeing as the fishing line is so clear and I'm not sure I'm doing what I'm saying I'm doing, I'm going to just keep repeating it until I'm confident it's safe. I may go down. You see how that slipped? Yeah. Okay, we got to learn from that. That's not what we want. I do get quite strong winds. So this has to be secure.
And it may just be a question of what is my next move going to be across the orchid to make sure it doesn't slip. So we're going to use that intel and move the fishing line down the stem a little bit. Getting rid of all the spaghetti that is in the way. Except for the dead spaghetti, that is helpful. The dead spaghetti, <laughs> dead roots, I'm using as a buffer. Also for the fishing line. Just to protect the stem. I would like to go underneath this one. Because it gets me closer to the nail as opposed to coming in so high. Okay, we're going to come in from the other side. I know I just cracked that root, but there is going to be collateral damage here, unfortunately. I'm sorry if you see my hand blocking what I'm doing. Pretty much I'm trying to repeat what I did before, but going this way. So I need to find the tension point. Now I was thinking maybe I should go in with the L hooks. That would have given me a better grip, but I don't have L hooks that are as large. That means the screw is very, very thin and I needed the thickness of this nail to be able to screw into the cork, seeing as my drill bit is a very small gauge and I only have the small gauge L hooks. So we'll make this work, see or see, it just may take a while because the thought process, the principle is working. The execution, you just have to be super duper careful. There we go. That's not going to slip. I just have to keep it a little bit taut. She says, I only lost one loop there. Okay. Now we're going to go across that part again. And find the loop on the other side. And while doing all that, try not to step on King's nose. Because now he has moved back into the sun and is right by my feet. Because why not, right? Okay, let's test this. So she's not moving. That's good. I do have to come back though, because my tie is right here. Anybody with a keen eye will see that I've got the fishing line right by two roots. They are not they are not going to harm the roots if I don't break them off manually just because of their location towards the fishing line because the weight of the orchid is obviously going to drop a little bit further and that'll release any tension that I've got going on there. Remember, she's upside down. Okay, reef knot and then screw in the two screws. We'll see if we can do that without cutting the orchid in half. There we go. She's fixed, secured. The next step is to see where I want the keiki to go. Because if I put her, if I put the keiki up, and behind, I may break the spike, which is of course something I really want to avoid. And then we also have the issue of misting. We don't want water in the crown. So maybe it's probably ideal if I could get her down a bit and just secure her down here. And then eventually she may attach to the mount with the roots, which will then stop me from being able to place the mount upright standing on the shelf. But I don't want to spoil the cakey either. So what we can also do is bring her around this side. We still have the roots, but we can guide them in, leaving the growing point, the crown, free of the spike. Once the cakey is independent, of course, I am intending to cut that off, but still. So now, Keiki over here, 
Let me see what I plan to do with that. Of course, that's the ideal place, in my opinion. Let me know in the comments what you would have thought to do, but I think that she is ideal here. The only thing is how to get her secured. I can do something here. Let's see if this works. Hey, <laughs> for now, until Keiki knows what I'm trying to tell it to do. We're not done yet, just a little tidy up. This root cleanup is not necessary seeing as we're doing, you know, bark on bark kind of thing. There's no decay that can affect the orchid or the climate or anything like that. But it gives me a better idea now to see what was dead, what I've cut off. Now I can observe how the roots are going to perform from here on in, seeing as I've taken off what is dead. And if anything dies now, I have much better observation. Let's say how it's progressing, how are things going with cutting off everything dead. I don't need the confusion now that I've got this orchid on a mount by seeing a dead root and then wondering, was that there before or did that happen after she was mounted? I wish I could mist her straight away, but that's not gonna happen. We still have one last step to go, for now anyway. Just stretching out a little bit of my hob filter material. Of course, for anybody that would prefer to use sphagnum moss, or other water retentive material to stop the roots from drying out too fast if you're in a super dry climate like mine. Then a little bit of something protecting the roots from drying out too quickly is advisable. And seeing as these roots were super accustomed to being rather wet, let's just say, even though it was a pot with large bark, I made sure that the mask underneath always had water. So there was always something wicking up. And I'm stretching it out because I'm trying to recycle this piece, make the most of it, take a little bit of the density away of it so that there's still plenty of airflow. And that also means I don't have to go and open a big, you know, fresh, let's say, square, and I can just use what I've got on hand and just be a little bit more conservative with my resources. So here we go. It'll do the job just as well. The reason I need it a little bit loose is because we're just gonna glue it on. With two little dollops or four little dollops of glue. So I don't want it to be too tight around the roots. And push comes to shove, I will open another bag, but I don't think I need to. Having done all that, and that's why I couldn't mist. The glue I'm using is not super glue because it burns through the hob filter material. It's too strong, too hot. I'm using children's craft glue. <laughs> Nothing fancy. And if needs must, eventually I can change it out. I don't think I'll need to do that. Let it get to look the way it's going to look. It'll be all right. And there she is, all purdy purdy. Gosh, it's been ages since this orchid has been in my collection and I've been umming and eyeing about what to do. I think this is going to work. It's gonna be cumbersome in the winter, but okay. We'll have to work with what we've got. Right now, I would love to mist her to show you how the roots green up, 
but it is not warm enough and I'm late afternoon now. I don't need this orchid to go indoors wet. Yes, you heard, indoors. It is the end of May and I have not got the night temperatures that would make this orchid happy. So we don't have 21 degrees. We don't have 20 degrees Celsius. We at the moment have 14 degrees Celsius. Many of my orchids are still coming inside. That includes her, meaning it's not that warm during the day either. So no misting. She's had her water for the day, having been soaked, and now I'm just going to leave it until tomorrow. But anyway, this is where we are at with Phalaenopsis pulchra. Finally, she's found a home, and I hope in time for some root growth and some attaching. So, having said all that, I shall detach myself from you, but not before thanking you for your time. Thank you so much for watching. So nice to have you here. Have yourself a fabulous day on that one condition though, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.